It's time to hit the road and discover Texas with Annie Studebaker. Get ready to travel deep into the heart of the Lone Star State, meeting friendly folks and exploring fascinating places. Experience a way of life like nowhere else in the world. As we uncover the rich history and culture of Texas, discover adventure, discover excitement, discover Texas with Annie Studebaker. Today, we'll meet three wonderful women with fascinating stories. The interior design of Nancy Huntley, the amazing artistry of quilting by Lois May Carnes, and the profound Western history of Charlie Brown will demonstrate why they have earned such a title. So sit back and enjoy the show. You know, when we built this house, we had uh, the bedrooms other than the uh, master bedroom. The other bedrooms were upstairs. And since it was just Charles and I that lived here, we decided we didn't need four extra bedrooms upstairs. So we only finished off one half of the upstairs, which were two bedrooms. And then we found some beautiful furniture we liked. So we had to finish off the rest of the house so we would have a place to put it. Charles and I uh, saw some beautiful French antiques and we loved them. And we said, well, there was no reason why we had to live with oak furniture if we didn't like it, so we decided we would use uh, the French. And so this is how we kind of got started. But especially since we decided to have this style of a home, which is typical of the uh, old plantation homes in Louisiana. And uh, Charles loved the Old South. He loved the history of the Civil War. And he just loved all of that stuff. And I did too, because um, I was in the travel business and I took groups uh, on tours. And we went, I think we've been in every beautiful old home in the South, all across the United States. And uh, you know, you just sort of fall in love with that style after a while. So we both agreed, this is what we liked. We liked the uh, old uh, Victorian uh, 1800s style with the columns and such. And so this is why we built this house. And so then the furniture fit perfect. The things that we liked fit in this house. Uh, we have, like this table right here, we have uh, some American furniture, uh, which is from the 1800s. And um, we love that too, because it's very much like the French. So that's, that's what we liked. And we've been collecting it, antique shows, estate sales, wherever you find it. It's kind of fun doing that. Well, when you're collecting antiques, you start with the furniture. You buy what you like, and then you find a place for it. And that's virtually what we have done. We've um, had to, you know, change things around a little bit. But that's way, the way you do, because it's the furniture that you like. And um, that's what we collect. And, and so that's the way it starts. It, you buy what you like, the furniture that you like, and then you find a place for it. But you know what's so much fun about uh, collecting antiques is there's a story behind every piece. You know, where it came from, who owned it, when it was done. Okay, the, the room with the twin beds uh, is French furniture and it of course came from France. It has all the emblems of all the different seasons on it. It has um, musical instruments, it has baskets of flowers, for the spring when, and the little shepherd's crook where they uh, would go out and gather up the little lambs and things. Uh, the people also, uh, when they harvested the fruit, the grapes and things for their wine, they um, would spend the night out sometimes, several nights at a time out in the, in the fields co collecting the grapes. So they would dance and sing around the fire at night. And uh, you see that reflected in the carvings on the beds because there's the bagpipes and the, the cymbals and all, all sorts of musical instruments that they use. So there's a lot of history behind that and tells a story. That particular group of furniture has two twin beds. It has a, an unusual armoire, which also has the symbols on it, a little nightstand or lampstand. 
in a beautiful dresser. And when you pull the drawer out, you can see that the dresser drawer is, is curved like this. It's really beautiful with a marble top on it. Then we have several other uh, bedroom groups. One of them has angels on the footboard and a beautiful uh, raised heart on the top. Uh, has a matching nightstands and armoire. And then another room has one that has the puffed heart, we call it. And uh, the way we decorated that room makes you think it's sort of um, a honeymoon suite. Charles named it the honeymoon suite because <laughs> it has the heart and, and uh, on it. The draperies uh, are custom made, of course, because the house certainly has tall ceilings, which is typical of this style home. But the ideas for them, I read lots of magazines, <laughs> lots of designer books that have this type thing in it. I have books from New Orleans of all the beautiful homes there, Natchez, Mississippi, and uh, different places like that that have um, this type of decor in it. And you just get ideas that way. I have lots of magazines that Charles would love for me to get rid of, and I said, oh, I just love them all. I love to just look at them. They're so beautiful. Hold on to your hat. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Lois May Carnes has lived an interesting life. She shared with us her history and passion for quilting, which she deeply enjoys. I'm Lewis May Carnes, and my address is Pearsall, Texas. And I live on a ranch, and I moved here in 1940. I've lived here 75 years. And my father-in-law bought the place, and we came out here and built barns and fences and just rebuilt everything. Everything was run down when we first moved here. My father-in-law was, oh, we had been in business in Yoakum, and they were so anxious to get out of town, get out on the ranch. They had never lived in the country. My husband hadn't, I, I had, so I knew what it was like. But my husband, before we married, told me he had asthma. He didn't realize when you get out in the country and you get in the cattle business, you get in dust, you get to farming, you just, you're in all kinds of dust with feed, and it didn't, help him in any way like that very much. We first moved here, we had an artesian well. Just flowed big, big, oh, just wonderful. That just, we all fell in love with that well. And it had a little, it run over down here, past where this house is, and made a little creek, run into a tank. We just started out fresh and kept going and worked for a dollar a day, you might say. And then the war came on, was coming on and uh, things got pretty tight everywhere. During the war, it's hard to get materials, so the house building went kind of slow. Our lives changed a whole lot. Wasn't so much fun and happiness for a while. Anyway, we survived it. When I was growing up, my mother quilted. It's just called the Lone Star. Oh, well, usually I'm making on two or three at a time, so I don't really, oh, I'll say six months. Yeah, I don't work fast anymore. But of course, then after I married and had a child and moved out here, I uh, didn't have much time to quilt. I have really picked, my husband died in 1984. And since then, my uh, son moved back to the ranch and sort of took over, you see, and I didn't have as much to do as I used to do. So uh, I started quilting a little more, I guess, than usual. And I belonged to the Extension Homemakers in Pearsall and Brill County. What you call a sampler quilt. That sampler, every block is different. And sometimes they're all different sizes. And that's what makes it really hard to put together. But if every block is just exactly the same, it's not too hard, but. Everyone is different, so I made a quilt like every one of these blocks. 
we would make quilts there, you know. I taught them how. But you make this block and then you sew the block together. You can make it as big as you want to, wide or as long. And uh, it's good if I ever had to go to the nursing home, that's, I will make quilts like this. See, I can't, I won't have a sewing machine. Right now I have a quilt in class in Pearsall connected with the church. We call ourselves the mission quilters and we give them the way to people's houses that burned down or then a storm, the tornado damaged me and also the club, the extension club. We made quilts and gave them to every charitable organization in Pearsall. 4-H'ers, Boy Scouts, Fire Department, and they auctioned it off, you know, and give the money, use the money that way. This is an Amish quilt pattern, and uh, it's real easy to cut out, you see, and all, you just have to and Mark, I have to just get those together like that, and but it's it's real simple. This just happened this summer. We uh, did a quilt, and it was all every block was uh, flowers, and uh, we auctioned that off publicly. You might say we got nine hundred and twenty-five dollars for that quilt. <laughs> that was the most we sold ever sold one for. I just enjoyed doing it, and now that I'm older and I can't do much yard work. I have good eyes. God's given me good eyes and I'll also show you some little girls dresses. I make little girls dresses to give to orphanages to little girls. And my little granddaughter was here summer or spring so I let her try on several of them you know. And I said now you, you, I'll let you pick one before I take them to the orphan's home. She said I want them all. <laughs> I said well you can't have them all because I'm making them for the little girls that don't have any mamas and daddies. And anyway, I enjoy, I had a little girl myself, you know, so I sewed for her always. And she sewed for her two girls, and so it it's kind of runs in the family that we love to sew. This was the one of the first quilts I made after I married. And it's a hand quilt, and everything's hand quilted too. This is what you call applique, but, uh, butterflies. Yeah, I made it 1936 and 37. Uh, when we were making trips out here to build up the place after we got and bought it, but we hadn't moved here yet. And uh, I was at home a whole lot by myself and they were coming back out here and bringing supplies and all. So um, I made that quilt then. Hold on to your hat, we'll be right back. Welcome back. Charlie Brown has always seen herself as a cowgirl. I enjoy talking to her about her roping skills and passion for leather crafting. My name is Charlene Reagan Brown, but nobody ever called me that. My, the day I was a, the year I was a day old, I became Charlie. <laughs> uh, I was the only girl. I had four brothers, and uh, we were in cow camp a lot of the times and we work cattle. I've worked cattle all my life, and I love it. I dearly love it. I wouldn't be in town for anybody. <laughs> I was raised in South Texas, and we, uh, I never went to one school, one school year, until I was in the seventh grade, and we were poor. Nobody had anybody. It was during the Depression. At one time, I rode a horse back and forth to school, we rode 12 and a half miles on the horse to get to Catula. It's a long way from town. My mom was a school teacher until she married, and uh, she's the toughest teacher I ever had. I'll tell you that. <laughs> she didn't give in for nothing. She didn't want me going by myself through pastures to get to school. But we had one patch that was between a high bridge here and a high bridge here, and there were lots of sunflowers and the sunflowers were taller than me on the horse. There was a season for them when they just fell over and they dried out. When they dried out, you can't believe how wonderful swords they were. And we used to have fights every day just playing, but uh, we had a very good time. We worked out in cow camp an awful lot. 
when we were gathering cattle or we were going to sell some or put them in a different pasture or something like that. When we rounded them up and got them in the pen, and, and my job was to get up on top of the pens there because <laughs> I wasn't scared of the cattle. When I went to college my first year, I was uh, in the dormitory there at Kingsville. I majored in agriculture and I was the only girl in every class all the way through. I went back to uh, visit there one time and they had five girls in there then. And now I think they have a whole bunch of girls. End of the first week of school, all the freshmen always had to entertain the upperclassmen, the professors, and they were invited to the auditorium there. And they said uh, they wanted me to do rope tricks. I said, I can't do rope tricks. And they didn't accept it. it says, you uh, live on a ranch and all ranchers can do that. So I called Daddy on the phone. They lived out of Raymondville, north of Raymondville, seven and a half miles. And uh, I told him that they wouldn't believe that I couldn't do tricks. And so when I got home, he had gone, I don't know where, but all over the country, and had found some ropes that he thought that I could use. We worked on those, and I'm left-handed, and he's right-handed, but we finally got it done. <laughs> I did rope tricks for the other three and a half years. And anytime anybody wanted me to, or I got paid a little bit for it, but I didn't the first year, but after that, I'd tell them I wanted $25 if I had to take that out, because I had to make it up in school. And so I thought that was fair. Now, I don't care if nobody ever watches. That doesn't make any difference to me at all. I just love doing it. Well, I've also made 30-something uh, pictures that I sold, and they were all leather. This is one of them that I did, and I sold five of them like that. See right here, this was a cowhide, and I cut it half in two. And then I had a um, book of things that you could do. And so I uh, had this a little bit too wet to use. And I cut out all of these things that I have, the horses. They were the main things here. And um, that's all I did that way. And then I would, with the different tools I had, this was one kind of tool. This was another tool. These were different tools. Pictures, when you draw pictures, the last thing is the centerpiece that stands out. But with this, it's the other way around. Whatever your center is going to be, you want to get that complete. And then you put these in because it's different spaces behind. It's so much fun. I'm a happy person normally. Very seldom am I unhappy. But I have been happy all my life. And I'm glad. It's a lot more fun than tears. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Interesting Ladies of South Texas. We're truly honored to have met them. We hope that by listening to their amazing stories will inspire all of us to explore our creative side. Until next time. but I have been happy all my life, and I'm glad. It's a lot more fun than tears.